Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't seem to have a timer on my screen at the moment. If somebody could be so kind as to like give me a 20 minute, 40 minute, something like that, that would be great. Okay. So I'm going to basically give you two totally separate talks today uh, because there's two different sorts of things that I want to cover. The first is going to be about Django REST Framework, in particular some design decisions in Django REST Framework 3. Um, and the second is going to be about API design generally and uh, some thoughts that I really want to share with you folks on that today. Okay, so first part, Django REST Framework 3, uh, which yes, is about ready to go. We'll probably do a, uh, a formal beta release tomorrow and hopefully roll out the release proper by the end of the month. Um, design changes that I want to talk about in that today. So we've made uh, some fundamentally API breaking changes. And I wanted to talk about one of those in particular with regards to serialization and explain the motivation behind making this fundamental change, uh, why we felt it was necessary. Well, I say we, it's nice to talk about the project in the plural, but <laughs> don't know, the royal, the royal we, me and REST framework. Uh, okay, so serialization, right. Well, when I talk about serialization, um, what, I'm, what I am referring to is the stage of mapping between an object instance and a primitive representation of that instance, right? So I'm not talking about, generally people would say serialization and they'd mean this whole thing, but in REST framework, we're specifically talking about this first pass. So this is serialization, deserialization, and validation, right? Uh, serialization is easy. Deserialization and validation, that's the tricky bit, and that's where these fundamental changes have come in for this release. Okay, so let's have a look at how validation works in 2.x. In 2.x, the way that validation works is pretty similar to how model form validation works. So we've uh, instantiated a serializer with a bunch of data that we want to validate, and then we call is valid on the serializer. And at the point that we call is valid, uh, three separate stages are happening. The first stage is that we run a bunch of validation on the serializer itself. So that includes field validation, uh, possibly a custom validate method on the serializer. The second thing that we do is we instantiate, but don't save a model instance. And then the third thing that we do is we perform some validation actually on the model instance itself by calling into full clean. Uh, once we've checked that it's valid, we have an instantiated object instance that we can inspect and modify on the serializer. And when we're all happy, we call save. Okay? 3.0, all change. Um, what we're doing now very similar API, we still have is valid and we still have save, but when we call is valid, what happens is all the validation that occurs, occurs on the serializer itself. We're not instantiating a model instance. Instead, all we're doing is ending up and returning uh, a bunch of validated primitive data. Um, now, we're still running the same set of validation rules, it's just that those are all happening on the serializer itself. So we've had to change some of the underlying machinery in order to do that. Once we've called is valid, we don't have an object instance anymore, we just have this validated data that we can inspect if we need to. And when we're all happy, we can call save. And if we want to uh, prod a few additional bits into the instance that we're creating, we can also add in some keyword arguments there. So we've still got the same set of functionality available to us, but the flow is different. So <clears throat> what this change means in terms of API for you is let's have a look at, well, we could be looking at using model serializers. We're not going to do that. We're going to look through a bunch of examples just using plain serializer classes because that's going to show us what's actually happening under the hood. Um, also, 
using plain serializer classes because I think it's really important to always be able to take that next step up or down in the layer of abstraction. If you can't do that, then you've got too much automagic behavior in there somewhere. So 2.x, we have a restore object method which handles both creates and updates. Here we're restoring the user instance and we're not saving it, right? Restore object gets called at is valid. 3.0, instead we have uh, two separate create and update methods and those instantiate and save and return a model instance or some other object instance. Okay, so why? Uh, first problem with the existing approach, and this is the biggest issue, is it gets really awkward to deal with relationships um, and the dependencies between relationships. So let's take a look. Here we've got two separate serializer classes that are mapping to two models in the database. And profile has a to one relationship with user. And we can see that we have that relationship, ex the reverse relationship expressed on the representation there. Um, so we write a restore object for both classes. The profile one is nice and easy because we have all of the information available to instantiate the profile instance. But the user one's difficult because we can instant we, we have most of the field information we need for the user, except for the fact that we haven't saved a user instance yet. So user does not have a primary key. And because user doesn't have a primary key, that means that we can't associate the profile model with it yet. So if we want to deal with this, we need to do something pretty ugly, which is we take the uh, profile instance and we hide it in a little bit of hidden state on the user. And this is what was happening in uh, model serializers in 2.x. And this is what you would have to do if you were trying to write this sort of stuff explicitly in 2.x, horrible. Uh, and then you also need to override save in order to pull out that little bit of hidden logic, uh, hidden state, and finally save the profile instance, right? Uh, 3.0, life is much nicer and simpler. Uh, it's worth pointing out that Django's model forms are kind of similar to 2.x here um, with regards to how they handle many-to-many uh, relationships. It's a little bit different for them because they don't deal with all sorts of nested relationships and so on, so there's less complexity there, but it's similar. Okay, so there we go, nice and simple. Uh, next problem that we're attempting to tackle by making this fundamental change is model encapsulation. Uh, specifically, um, that in 2.x, because of the way you instantiate model instances directly, you're not calling into model manager classes, uh, which loses you a layer, of, uh, a layer of encapsulation that we ought to have available to us. So the general advice in uh, kind of as a sensible thing to do in Django is fat models, thin views. And I've written this blog post explaining why I think that a uh, a more precise definition of how to tackle uh, this design problem that you have of trying to make sure that your state changing operations are nicely um, encapsulated and that you can go to a single point in your code base and feel really confident that you know uh, what are the state changing operations that occur and is your application data state always going to be consistent is to say never, never, never must I write to any model attribute outside of the context of its model class or its model manager class, right? And that is an easily reviewable, enforceable point of code policy, right? And if you stick to that, you will be sure that 
every time you're doing something state changing that lives within this one little block of stuff that you can go and scan and check and comprehend. If you directly prodding these things in from views or anywhere else, you're kind of screwed because you have no idea where in your code base these operations may be being performed. So <clears throat> let's take a look at a concrete example of that. Uh, what we've done in this example is we've decided in developing our application that a nice, safe thing to do from the point of view of encapsulation would be to ensure that developers working with our application's code base are only ever going to be creating user instances and profile instances in tandem. Right? That there's no possibility for a developer to accidentally hit a code path where they've created a user but they don't yet have a profile instance, right? So let's try and enforce our application level data integrity, right? And we've done that by re writing a uh, custom create on the manager class that takes all of the arguments it needs and creates both the user instance and the profile instance at the same time. And because we have this new policy of never write to the, never instantiate the model directly outside of a model manager class and never prod its attributes in arbitrarily, uh, we're sure that our developers are always going to be calling into this sort of thing, so we're nice and safe. With uh, 2.x and model forms, what ends up happening is we're just instantiating the user object directly, and we haven't got any way of calling into this method because this is only going to be called at the point of save, but we already want to have an object instance by that point. In 3.0, that sort of level of abstraction ties in nicely to the new serializer API. You're only calling save at the point that you've done all of the validation. So there you go. Um, <coughs> another thing that we're trying to address is um, making the validation behavior very explicit and obvious to the team. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of this. Um, so we have a profile model, right? And we have our model in the we have our model defined, and we have a badge number field, which will be a models dot integer field. And then at some point we decide, oh, we ought to have a database uniqueness constraint on the badge number and we want our badge number to be globally unique, right? Now, in 2.x, the way that you would enforce this uniqueness constraint is you'd say, okay, well, I'm writing my serializer class directly, so if I want to enforce uh, uniqueness constraints on the model instance, I'd better call full clean, because that's the bit of Django machinery that will do that for me. Okay. That's fine, except what the hell else is actually happening there? All sorts of things, right? We wanted to add a uniqueness constraint. We've just called into a whole bunch of validation behavior that we don't necessarily understand exactly what different sets of operations are running there. In 3.0, it's a very different style in that all of these things are applied explicitly, right? So we still have functionality to allow you to express validation constraints, but you do so explicitly on the serializer class rather than just calling into full clean and letting it handle all of that stuff for you. Uh, you can also have validation constraints that apply across models, uh, across fields on a serializer. And we handle other cases like the unique for, unique for year, unique for month, and other things like that. I don't think there are other things like that. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's all of them. Okay. Um, so next design problem. Okay, fine. So we've got all of this very nice, explicit style of validation. However, we would still like to be able to use the model serializer shortcut and have that uh, do lots of the heavy lifting for us in cases where that's easier. So... 
the way we get around that is we still have the model serializer class, um, but we bridge the gap for the developer between what a model serializer is and what a serializer class is by having printable representations of an instance of a serializer that will show you exactly what set of fields have automatically been created for it and what set of validations have been created automatically for it. All right? And in the whole, when you look at the changes between model serializers in 2.x and model serializers in 3.0, in uh, 2.x, model serializers had all of this magic of a specific way of enforcing their validation behavior, whereas because all of the validation is explicit, now what model serializers do is a very simple set of things. It creates a set of fields for you automatically, uh, possibly create some validators for you automatically, and give you, uh, the final thing, give you a default create and update implementation. So it's very easy to move between these two layers of abstraction. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other places where it's important that the validation behavior is explicit. Unique togetherness, right? So unique together in a Django, mo Django model form or in a 2.x serializer, if you have a unique together constraint that exists on field A and field B, but you happen to only include one of those fields on your serializer or form, the uniqueness constraint silently won't run. And the first time that you'll know if you violate it will be that you'll get an integrity error in the database. Now, kind of the same in 3.0 in that if you only include one of the fields, you won't end up having the validation constraint applied on the serializer, but it's explicit and you can see that it's no longer there, or if you're writing the serializer manually, you'll see that you haven't put it in. You, you know, you either have or you haven't included it. Uh, another place where it's useful is field validation. It's difficult to know sometimes with field validation when something fails. Has this failed because the field validation failed on the serializer class, or has the, field, has the model field validation uh, been triggered, right? So an example of this would be integer fields, um, Django's model integer field, that will have a validation rule on the maximum, uh, the maximum value that you can provide it, and it's dependent on the database backend. Now, if you're using 2.x, you simply don't see that validation rule anywhere. It's, it's just kind of hidden. In 3.0, when you printed out the representation of the serializer class, you'd end up explicitly seeing, oh, well, here's this uh, maximum value validation that it's pulled across from the model instance into an equivalent validation rule on the serializer. Um, <clears throat> so cons consequences of making this change, well, we handle all of the field validation in a, in uh, functionally the same, you know, to the outside world. All the field validation is still being run. All the uniqueness validation is still being run. One thing that we can't do is we can't run any custom model dot clean method because we don't have a model instance to run it on. Um, so instead of doing that, you should be putting your behavior in serializer dot validate. Right. Um, if you really, really want, you could instantiate a model instance inside your validate and call full clean on that, but it would be a bit gross, and you shouldn't really need to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next thing. There's all this funky, nice stuff that happens for you when you're using the built-in serializers, but sometimes you'd like something more direct than that. You have a custom use case, or perhaps you, for performance reasons, you don't want all of REST Framework's serializer field machinery to be running 
for this particular serializer. So what we do is we provide a base serializer class that has a set of unimplemented methods. Depending on what functionality you need, you'd either, either override one or more of these. If you're just writing a read-only serializer class, the only thing you'd need to override would be to representation. A couple of other ones in there as well. And the key point here is that it exposes the same interface as the standard serializer classes, which means you can write all of your um, serialization and or deserialization and validation code completely explicitly, but still plug the class into REST Framework's standard generic class-based views and have everything work exactly the same way as it would before, which gives you another layer that you can drop down if you need to do so for whatever reasons. Um, the only thing, uh, and everything will work exactly as it would before, the only thing that is changed here is in the browsable API, you won't get nice form representations for your data input because there's no way of determining what the form should look like. Okay, let's take a look at rendering. Oh, great. <clears throat> okay, so we've transformed our data into a primitive representation and we now want to um, transform that into bytes that we can put onto the wire, right? Now with JSON and other simple formats like that, that's really easy because we can do something that is pretty much the same as json.dumpS. However, we can also do super smart things like this. Uh, take the exact same data structure and render it into an HTML form. How do we do that? So, answer is, serializer.data is almost exactly the same as a basic ordered dict or a, uh, or a list, except that it contains a backlink to the serializer instance. Right, so it contains a serializer attribute that your renderer class can then use to access the field information on the serializer. And then our serializers provide a, uh, an interface that is very similar to Django Forms uh, interface with a get item and an, an iter uh, that allow you to both identify the uh, value that's been input, any errors that occur during deserialization, and all of the other attributes on the field. We do this by having, uh, we don't want to be mutating state all over the place, so this uh, interface returns bound field interfaces that proxy most of the things onto the pretty much immutable field instance, uh, except for the value and the errors on it, right? Uh, we also want to be able to do neat things like simulate the sort of data structures that HTML forms aren't very good at handle or don't support, full stop, uh, like nested structures and lists. Uh, what we have there is the serializer class checks whether the incoming data is a query dict or not, and if it is, it is able to perform some transformations in order to simulate uh, nested or list structures, so we have a format for being able to do those within standard HTML forms. Um, we've got all of this nice HTML rendering stuff, but we don't want to couple that too tightly to the fields and the serializer implementation where we can avoid it. So uh, one thing that we do is we have a... Um, an attribute on fields, which is just called style, and it's a dictionary. And its behavior is underspecified and is determined by the renderer that you're using. Now, typically, you're really only going to be interested in HTML form renderer, but at least we're keeping the behavior underdefined here. And this lets us then do things like 
our HTML form renderer can have some nice, clever logic for how to switch between selects and uh, radio selects uh, without jamming all of that into the fields themselves. Another thing that's related to that is we'd like to be able to do inheritance type stuff when we're using our form rendering, such as we would like to be able to say, here's some base stuff that happens on field, and anything that subclasses field uh, should also have these applied, unless there's a more specific match. So we have a sneaky method of using uh, inheritance style lookups, but without having to define the attributes on the class itself, because that's not where we want the implementation. We don't want the implementation on the field, we want it on the renderer. And that's actually quite a cute little pattern, I think. So, da -da 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 -da, put that all together, and it's easy to build templated HTML generation, where we have a base form.html for your default form, and we have a bunch of templates for uh, for all the fields, and snazzy, yeah, okay. So, uh, lots of, so there are some breaking API changes. These have been limited to places where there's a fundamental necessity to change it. We can't keep backwards API compatibility and still have the same style of validation. It doesn't make sense. Um, one other nice thing that I haven't mentioned is that the, um, the serializer, the serializers are also planned to expose the right set of API to be able to use them directly in Django's generic class-based views as well. So you'll be able to use them as an alternative forms implementation directly with regular class-based views. Um, all of the fundamentals of this are in 3.0 and ready to go. The HTML form stuff won't be public API until 3.1 in a two or three months' time, because I'd like some time to bed it in first. Okay, let's move on to something completely different. Um, I want to talk about web API design more generally now. So here's a pretty fundamental question. How do we build systems that communicate with each other? Right? What is a sensible way for us to think about, talk about, and build objects that we can interact with and that express their state and available actions? Okay, so there's a bunch of people who are also interested in similar things, and there's lots of hypermedia formats coming out at the moment. Um, I personally haven't found any of them that compelling yet because I can't see what the concrete user benefits of them are. I, I don't see the uh, potential for really exciting tooling. Uh, you know, there's talk about, well, these are more loosely coupled systems, and yes, to some extent it's true, and yes, you can do some nice tooling, but it, it feels a little limited to me. Uh, so let's look at some hypermedia formats that have done pretty well for themselves. Okay, RSS. So, RSS is a hypermedia format. And, okay, it's a domain-specific hypermedia format, so it's very limited in what it's used for. But even though the... Um, say, say you wanted to come up with... What, what's the big sell for this... Oh, man, until Q... Oh, forget about them. <laughs> uh, what's the big win with your new format? Oh, hey, it's this great thing. It's a list of links with associated titles and descriptions. Um, well, that doesn't sound that exciting. I can't see that succeeding. Except that you have this huge network effect of being able to build this shared tooling for this one common format. Great, but domain-specific. HTML. HTML's done pretty well. Um, <laughs> well, you know. 
so um, the, the, the basic thing that HTML doesn't address for our needs as programmatic uh, API, web API developers, is it, it's not intended for programmatic use, right? It's, in, it's uh, tightly coupled to this document model that has a kind of UI, an implicit UI model, um, and it doesn't have any way of expressing primitive data types beyond strings and very simple interactions that are just key value pairs of strings in, in the forms that you can use. Okay. Um, so, slightly different slant. Let's think about layering in the web applications that we build and in the web application platform. So we started off with, this is our wonderful snazzy application that we built. You can see it's going to be a huge hit. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take this application that we built and we're going to peel off this layer that we all know and understand. Well, we don't know it or understand it, but JavaScript. And once we've peeled away, you know, in your mind's eye, take this off of your application and we still have the same basic application underneath, but without any of the interactive elements. Okay. Next thing that we're going to do, so now we'll, now we'll peel off the styling layer from this application that we've built. And now we've just got the uh, raw structural content underneath. Okay, well, what's left? Well, actually, we've still got quite a lot of implicit structure and um, information that is very document-centric. So what I think we need to think about doing is let's peel off the HTML layer from that and get at the raw data object model that underlies the document object model. And the data object model is an object that contains all of the uh, data primitives that you need to be able to render your application, plus all of the available interactions that are there on the document, right? And there's the, here's the difference between the two is the data object model is intended as a programmable interface that is not in any way tied to the UI whatsoever, whereas the document object model has this implied correspondence to the UI model as well and isn't programmable. So what we're building is an abstract object interface for our applications that can be a common element that both our native applications and our web applications will talk to the same model. Now, the implementation of both of those things may be implemented in a different library, but they're talking to the same underlying application. And what we have here is this is the essence of your application distilled into a completely data-centric vision of the application with the interactions that you're able to perform on it. Okay. Now, Notice during all of this time, we haven't said anything about JSON or HTTP. And the reason is because the client application doesn't care about those things, right? The client application is built to interface with the data object model. And we've expressed, uh, we, or we will express, what the data object model looks like. But the encoding, how we put that onto the wire and off the wire, and the transport and how we send it off between the client and the server, the client doesn't need to know about those things. Okay. Um, now, there's lots of possible ways that we could think about how we would express uh, an abstract object interface, but I'm just going to take a fairly simple, this is something that I think would be functional. Now, I built some of this stuff in a project called doc.json that I hadn't quite got all of my ideas straight in my head at that point. So if you look at that project, you'll see some of this and some of the seeds of this, but it's not quite there. Um, so top level in our data object model is a document, and that 
must have a uh, meta attribute, and the meta attribute must have a URI, may have a title, may have a description, and then you can have any other attributes on the document, and those may be primitive data types, or they may be links, or they may be other nested documents inside this document. Um, links will have a URI that identifies where that action has to occur. Um, a transform that it applies, which will either be, let's follow this link and return an entirely new data object model, or let's apply this transform and return a new, excuse me, a new data object model with just this nested document uh, switched out, and some other stuff like the media type it points to if you want to include images or such, like uh, the encoding that needs to be used if you want to support file uploads or, or so on. And then what we have given ourselves is the ability to build generic client libraries on top of the data object model. So, um, I'm going to completely gloss over what the um, what's going in and out of the wire for these operations because it's not actually a very difficult design problem. That the difficult design problem is trying to figure out what capabilities do our abstract object interfaces need to be able to support. So here's a kind of guide for a walkthrough for your canonical example of a to-do list service. We go and our hyper library doesn't know anything about this API. We go off and retrieve it, and we've got a title for it, so it's telling us something useful about it. We can go and inspect uh, the content of this document. We can uh, modify one of the nested documents inside it and get ourselves back a new top-level document as a result. We can delete elements from it. Uh, and we can perform modifications on the top-level document object as well, which returns us, in this case, a, um, you know what I'm saying. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, and, okay, so that's a very cruddy-style uh, web service application. Let's also take a, a brief moment to think about other sorts of services that you might build with it that are more like standard applications. So let's say we're going to build a chess service uh, with this style of API. And our data object model gives us a, a play move uh, action that we can perform, which moves one of our pieces. The computer then figures out computers move and returns you the new board state with you having made your move and the computer having made its state. We have a bunch of other actions that we can do. And we also say have a link to a different state in the application, which is the saved games. So that would return us a differently structured data object model, which would give us all the saved games that we can then go and uh, say, let's follow that saved game and then come back to a board state for that game. And once you start to talk about building those sorts of applications, what I think is interesting is that um, it's not even necessarily just um, interfaces over the network where this is a, where there's inherent value in this design style. You can also think about this as just a general purpose encapsulation whereby we can build a game engine in one language, we can build the UI in a different language, and yet we still have what looks like a native client library interface between the two, right? So, um, generic client libraries we've talked about. Other, th other shared tooling that you can build once you have a common object interface in browser tools, right? So if you define a canonical mapping from the data object model to HTML, you can build a common way of rendering the 
core of your application in a way that the user can interact with that is devoid of any UI concerns whatsoever, right? And that's just giving you the essence of your application. What that's also really nice for as well is because all of this can be interacted with programmatically, we've given ourselves a way of functionally testing our applications that we don't normally have at the moment. At the moment when we want to test the complete end-to-end -end functionality of our applications for web applications, we're having to use uh, browser tools like Selenium. Now, to be able to completely functionally test the essence of your application, okay, maybe missing out some of the in nice interactive things that JavaScript will give you, but to be able to get the majority of the way there, that's a huge win. You can see how when you've got store user stories coming in, it's then very easy to think about, okay, well, here's the story I want to be able to write, and I can spec that up as this is what the application needs to be able to allow me to do with it. Uh, you can also start to think about would we be able to write common UI binding libraries? So can we write shared tooling for how we uh, work with this shared data object model in React or in iOS or whatever? Um, other smart things that we can do, because we're only talking about interfacing the client library with the... Uh, with the abstract object interface, if we go and upgrade the library that we're using to do that to the latest snazzy version, oh look, all of a sudden, um, my client library isn't using JSON anymore. It's using more compact representation. It may not even be talking over HTTP anymore. Um, we can do things like have our client libraries uh, transparently prefetch linked images for us without the, uh, the, the program itself having to know anything about that or do anything about that. Um, yeah, like that. So, yeah, I, I think that at the moment, I think that we, we feel that we're confident and happy that we're doing a really sensible thing with web APIs. We've got a bunch of conventions about this is how we build them and you know, this, this method means one thing, but we're not talking about any of the fundamental issues of system communication, right? Of how do we express objects and services in a way that we can interact with them at this abstract level that gives us the ability to write shared tooling. And, You've got to think big for this, right? Because the, the real, real benefits only come in when you get the network effects, right? If you write a single API in this style and you write your client library and you use that once, no big deal. If you write a whole swathe of APIs in this and you write a single client library for each big language, suddenly you've got your client libraries for free in, in all of those. Um, okay, I'm going to ask myself one question first because, <laughs> uh, and, and that's, you know, isn't this the same as all the other RPC stuff that came before? And the answer is no, this is like the web, right? RPC, you have this single, you know, the, those styles, you have a single endpoint and that expresses all the actions that you can do. And then you go and you send some stuff back to that endpoint and you get something back from it. And there's no interlinking between different resources or ability to link between different systems or potential for caching those responses or any of that good stuff. Um, this isn't really radical because we've already built the web, right? We've already seen how the web can be a big success. But if you look at what we've done with the web and think about, well, can we just pull one layer back on that and get something more fundamental underneath there that we can, you know, build a programmatic web on? So there you go. Thank you. I'm going to ask the first question, or the second question, because you've already asked yourself one. Um, so this is going back to the REST framework stuff. Um, with REST Framework 3, do you reckon it's quite reasonable to build a non-API non website, 
if that makes sense. So just a, a standard HTML interaction website, but using REST framework instead of model forms everywhere. Yes, but in 3.1 when that API becomes public. Okay, cool. That's quite exciting. So it's a bit of a follow-on to Mark's question. So um, I, I, it was interesting looking at um, the changes between 2x and, and 3o because I think you've described, at least for me, most of my complaints about the form system. And so I'm sitting here thinking, well, hey, you fixed them, so should we, should we just drop forms and, and use uh, REST framework instead? <laughs> Luckily, I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, as I'm asking. <laughs> ask, ask me another day. I have no idea. No, I mean, it, you know, yes, Let's but see if it works first. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Andrew. So going back to your hypermedia stuff, um, one of the problems we've had with writing sort of a generic accessing API at Eventbrite is that versioning and changing the back-end behavior. Like we will be trying to isolate our clients from the continuously evolving models and stuff. Like what's your vision for that? Like how do you sort of get versioning? Because like on a web page and HTML, people adapt. Computers don't adapt so well. So how, how do you see that happening? Not any different answers to building standard web APIs. The same set of answers. There's nothing fundamental, you know, nothing cleverer than that. You know, except whether it's accept headers or whether it's about making fields generally be non-required or whatever, but same set of answers, nothing new. Tony, do you have a question? Yeah. My question is uh, kind of small, technical, uh, and it keeps bugging me. Um, you've said that the serializer keeps, uh, or data produced by serializer keeps a backlink to serializer, and that creates a, a reference cycle. Uh, don't, are you, aren't you afraid that this will cause um, kind of a, a garbage collector in Python to have to do much more work than it usually does? Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I suggest you try and break it tomorrow. Um, yeah, sorry, one question regarding the hypermedia stuff. It's really interesting. But have you, how would you handle state with that? So, you know, we have, where, like, for example, REST APIs, they're good because you have this idea of, of, of no, st no stateful, uh, statefulness. How do you handle statefulness with that hypermedia stuff you were speaking about before, for example, the chess, right? How would you handle that? Uh, again, not any different to... The standard. The only the only thing that's difficult with the uh, data object model and thinking about state is if you perform an interaction that alters uh, more than one object instance, and you have both of those nested within inside a common document, you have to make sure that you're expressing that interaction on the parent document because mm. you want to change the entire document rather than just one of the sub-objects. Now, obviously, maybe some other point in time somebody's come up with a better, maybe there are better ways of doing, building a, a data object model that don't have that, or maybe there's smart things that you can do where they actually get pushed back to the object model because, you know, but, yeah. Uh, this is this may sound also uh, uh, small and technical. Uh, in the document object, in the basic object model that you described, you had uh, the URI as a mandatory field, the only mandatory field really. Um, but then you opened the door to uh, nested documents. So I'm thinking nested documents also have URIs. Does that mean that nested documents also have to be accessible as independent documents? And what do you think about that? Uh, you could do it either way around. I mean, the important thing is that definitely the top level document would need to have a URI for sure because you want to be able to... Um, I, I would say it makes sense to always have it because then in your definition of the object interface, as part of that definition, you can say the meta attribute on a document always has a refresh link on it, right? And, and you can just build that into your model. I think it makes, but not necessarily. Mm. Okay, so here's the other question is, 
the reason why they will always have a URI is why wouldn't you want them to? Because what they are is containers for the interactions inside them. Right? So if you had one which didn't have a URI, don't bother using a document, just use a plain object mapping instead. For like uh, the hypermedia stuff, for non hierarchical data that you would like then represent by links, I suppose, to, to other but how do you represent the actions that then span those link relationships? Because if you do it in a, in a hierarchical model, it's like you, you, you as you said, you just change one attribute in the do, in the DOM and then that is the whole DOM. But if you have several kind of DOMs linked together uh, both in the client space uh, and you want to do actions that affect them all. Can you represent that in this? Uh, no. So similar to opening two tabs in your browser, right, and you go and you perform some interactions in one of them and suddenly the other one happens to be out of date. It isn't expressing the true state of the application. Yeah, but uh, uh, no, I, m I meant that the DOM thing with nested elements... Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of like that, that seems to, to, to model a hierarchical model very very well but what, what about like a kind of cyclical or, or a, a relationship model that is not non-hierarchical yeah you just need to handle those by returning new documents each time right okay I think the, the top level object doesn't necessarily need to refer to like a real model class on a database somewhere. It can be an, an abstract concept that is your app, you know, your application, like yeah. presumably with a chess, like you might have a game, you might have a game table in your database somewhere, but you might, you might not, it might just be his game and game, you know, all the other things live underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carl. So this is back to the, the DRF 3.0 stuff and the serializers. Um, you, you started out motivating some of those changes, talking about fat models and having your, your model layer be a internally consistent representation of your, your domain level business logic that uh, handles all of those state changes uh, internally so you know where to look for that stuff. And so I was a little surprised that one of the uh, outcomes of the changes is that essentially you can't express custom model validation within your model layer anymore because the serializers won't respect, uh, can't respect the custom clean methods. So I'm just curious if you could speak a little more about how that's, it seems a little inconsistent. Sure, okay. So um, in a standard Django application that's built kind of how the docs tell you to build, the clean methods, right, the only point of, in maybe I'm saying something's totally stupid and wrong here, but really the only point of interaction with that is the model forms, right? So why not have that validation be on the serializer class instead? Why not write that validation at the point where it's being called into rather than not, there's no fundamental, you know, it shouldn't be difficult to pull those bits of validation rule across. Um, and yes, there's a different, you know, it's a slightly different trade-off, but it feels worthwhile to me. I guess if you're combining it with a greater level of using constraints and stuff in your database, you've kind of got, you, you've pulled all the validation out of there and it's kind of gone into two separate locations. So it will fundamentally fall over there rather than at model.clean. Any other questions? In that case, thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, folks. <laughs>